Hello everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion, The Weight They Carry, Managing the Impact of Moral Injury on First Responders and Other Public Safety Personnel. I'm Dr. Kathy Kamkar, a clinical psychologist and associate professor, Temerty Faculty of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry, University of Toronto. I would like to acknowledge first the land on which this panel discussion is being hosted. The Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, CIPSERT, is housed at the University of Regina, located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the ancestral lands of the Cree, Solto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakoda nation nations, and the homeland of the Metis. It's an honor to welcome you all to this panel discussion with our experts on a topic that is not only pertinent, but so significant in our society today, moral injury among our public safety personnel. Moral injury is a term once primarily associated with the military, has increasingly become recognized as, in, as an important concern within the public safety sector. It is a concept that dwells into the ethical dimensions of the work carried, carried out by those who dedicate their lives to protecting and serving our communities. Potentially morally injurious events, PMIE, can take various forms, including exposure to actions, inactions, or events that violate a person's beliefs of right and wrong betrayal by a trusted person, leadership shortcomings, or organizational failures. So moral injury is this distressing psychological, behavioral, social, and sometimes spiritual aftermath of exposure to such events. It is about the wounds inflicted on the soul when individuals are exposed to situations that challenge their deeply held moral beliefs and values. So it is very important to recognize and address moral injury as part of this comprehensive moral health support <clears throat> for our public safety personnel. And we do know now that a growing body of research highlights the ways that frequent exposure to potentially psychologically traumatic events can negatively impact the mental health and well-being of our public safety personnel and contribute to the development of operational or post-traumatic stress injuries. Similarly, exposure to one or more potentially morally injurious events can result in moral injury that may be associated with mental health challenges. So this panel discussion will discuss the profound impacts of moral injury on our public safety personnel, as well as emergent guidelines for supporting and treating individuals negatively impacted by the moral weight of their service. It is with an immense pleasure that I would like to introduce you to our wonderful panelists. Dr. Suzette Bremont phillips Professor, Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine within University of Alberta, as well as the Director of Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium. Dr. David Malloy, President, King's University College at the Western University. Dr. Liana Lenz, former police officer and a research associate passionate about public safety personnel, bio, psycho, social, and spiritual wellness education. Dr. Margaret McKinnon, professor and associate chair, research, De Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences within McMaster University, as well as the research lead mental health and addictions within the St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. Dr. Lorraine smith McDonald, Assistant Professor and Co-Chair, Department of Psychotherapy and Spirituality, Stan Stevens College, University of Alberta. Dr. Nicholas Colton, Professor of Psychology, Department of Psychology within University of Alberta, University of Regina, and of course, our scientific director of the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, CIPSERT. We're also happy to share that this panel discussion was inspired by the forthcoming Moral Injury Guide, 
for public safety personnel and leaders, which is scheduled for release in May. Also, we wish you to know that throughout the course of this presentation, we invite you to place your questions in the Q&A box. We will try, of course, to get as many of questions as possible when we reach to our questions and answers segment. And you also have the option of asking your questions anonymously. Now let's please start a great presentation. Thank you with a great introduction, Katie. Um, so we're happy today to introduce the Moral Injury Guide that Katie just spoke of that will be coming out next month. Uh, we created this guide to operationalize and clarify a definition of moral injury to better help those working on the front lines. So the work of our team uh, comes from uh, several researchers with expertise in different areas, um, psychology, occupational therapy, leadership, spirituality, philosophy, and public health, who've all worked on the front lines as clinicians and public safety personnel. So the current guide was designed to inform organizational team and individual moral awareness, promote resilience, and to provide guidance for proactive efforts to protect the well-being of public safety personnel at risk of exposure to PME IEs or public, or sorry, potentially morally injurious events or PMEs, as some of us call it. We hope the guide will help researchers to better understand and mitigate the impacts of these PMEs. Um, so part one of the guide provides information to, exp to um, explain the moral, ethical, and value landscape in which PSP engage and showcase this opportunities to explore the roles, responsibilities, and capacities of individuals and organizations with respect to PMEs and moral injury. Part two presents a framework for organizations, leaders, and, in and individuals showing the impacts PMEs may have on public safety personnel and what might be done to manage or mitigate the effects of these exposures. Next slide, please. Before we start, we'd also like to acknowledge that this new guide is building on knowledge of other, other researchers in the area. So it was inspired by moral stress amongst healthcare workers during COVID-19, a guide to moral injury released by Phoenix Australia, Center for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, and, and the Canadian Center of Excellence for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and Other Mental Health Conditions, which is now ATLAS. We'd like to thank the authors of the original work for the contribution to the field of moral injury and for their permission to adapt their guide to fit public safety personnel. We'd also like to thank the Canadian Community of Practice for Moral Injury, particularly Stephanie Gould, Walter Callahan, Sarah, Sarah Rodriguez, Artus Husseini, Patrick and Patrick Smith for reviewing and providing feedback on the document. We'd also like to thank those at Phoenix Center, particularly Andrea Phelps, for reviewing the document. Finally, we'd like to thank SIPSearch for their initiative and support for creating this guide to address the needs of public safety personnel and to acknowledge CIHR for funding the Compromised Conscience Catalyst Grant, which generated much of the new public safety personnel moral injury knowledge in the current guide. Next slide, please. Dave. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Um, so my my contribution to this uh, to this team and and in particular the guide was to give uh, a bit of a landscape on uh, morals, ethics, and values. And I, I think the the first thing I want to say is um, uh, these are not synonymous terms. And I think part of the problem is um, not only in in this field, but uh, actually everywhere we talk about uh, philosophical terms, there there is a tendency to talk about something as moral and they think it's ethical and they think it's value based but these are these are three very different things and again it really depends on on um uh who the foundational work uh um that you're basing this on from our perspective we were uh using as as a theoretical a philosophical foundation um, going back to origins, Aristotle and then later um Aquinas in the way we've divided these these terms up so uh, very quickly, and I'd be happy to answer questions uh, later on in the presentation if anyone has any. Um, we we're we're perceiving uh, morals as being uh, very broad, universal concepts seeking the good, 
So these are concepts that regardless of the individual, regardless of the organization, regardless of the, of the culture, um, these are things that we fundamentally as humans um, innately believe. So uh, for example, um, the torture of a child is universally um, wrong and no one would uh, in their heart of hearts, um, disagree with that statement. That would be that would be a universal principle. Now, ethics, uh, and and we we have very very fundamental uh, beliefs that are universal, and and frankly, very few beliefs that are universal because our our cultural orientation uh, guides us in, in different directions on how we interpret that. Ethics, on the other hand, are much more context specific, and in in our in, in this conversation, this is really looking toward the. Uh, the ethics, the ethics codes of organizational contexts. So these are very specific uh, guidelines. They're very specific statements, but they're they are derived from um, these universal concepts. So morals are universal. Ethics are much more specific, either either based culturally or uh, organizationally. Um, both morals and ethics are externally driven. So these are our guidelines of how we ought to live based on external criteria. This is where values differ. And I think there's a lot of confusion when we talk about ethics and values synonymously. Values are, uh, they can be driven from organizational ethics and they can be driven from morals, but values are created by the individual. Um, values, technically, a value is a, a concept, so it's something we make up, of the desirable, with a motivating force. What that means is that our behaviors, our actual behaviors, not our intended behaviors, but our actual behaviors are a function of what we value. So, for example, if I say I value exercise, but I don't exercise, um, it's not truly a value that I hold. My behavior is a reflection of my value. So as we go through uh, our, our conversations today, I, I just want to emphasize that uh, we've differentiated these. Um, and also, um, you know, in further conversations, you can see where there might be some breakdown from a leadership perspective in organizations where uh, ethical codes or, or ethical statements uh, may say one thing, but the values of the uh, individuals in the organization, whether they're leaders or uh, officers in the field, those values may differ. And that's where we have tension. Um, and in some of the research that, uh, that my colleagues and I have done, that's where you see the notion of betrayal, where organizational ethical statements are not reflected in actual behaviors of either leadership or members. So I, I, I think I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions that anyone has uh, later on in the presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so what does this translate to practically when we think about what is moral injury? And so moral injury describes this psychological, emotional, social, and spiritual harm or impairment that results from experiencing a violation of deeply held morals, ethics, or values. So moral injury arises from circumstances where a person does or fails to do something that violates their morals, ethics, or deeply held personal values. An MI can arise when a person feels betrayed or witnesses others behaving in ways perceived to be morally wrong. So if you go to the next slide, please. What we see is that these potentially morally injurious events or what we're gonna term PMEs for simplicity for today can really be broken down into three main boxes. And there's numerous PMEs that are associated with um, public safety personnel and first responders, which my colleague Leanna will speak about in a moment. But if we think about it in terms of these three boxes, there is self-orientated moral transgressions. So this involves doing or failing to do something in line with your MVE net uh, framework. So that's morals, ethics, and values that Dave just spoke about. There's other orientated moral transgressions involving being exposed to an MEV transgression committed by someone else. And then betrayal, which is an MVE transgression committed by a trusted person or group of people. <clears throat> 
It's also important to note that there seems to be at least three broad categories, another three broad categories, which also include acute, chronic, and cumulative PMEs. And so you can have a number of experiences of, let's say, betrayal or other oriented people. So it's not always necessarily just one event that causes challenges, it can be a variety of challenges. Different people also respond differently to the same PMEs. And so whether someone becomes morally injured or not seems to be dependent on at least five elements. The first is the number, level, and intensity of that PME exposure. The second is the role that played the role played by the person regarding the PME. The third is the perceived agency that the person has regarding the PME. The fourth is the perception the person has of their own morals, ethics, and values. And five, which is most important, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is the possibility to repair the violation that has occurred. And over to you, Liana. Next slide. Thanks, Frank. So looking specifically at PME and first responders, so a subsection of public safety personnel, well, primarily firefighters, police officers, uh, paramedics, and communicators. Uh, what recent research, some of our research and some research from Sarah Rodriguez uh, indicates that there's some slightly different um, PMEs that first responders experience compared to perhaps some other PSP groups. So what we noticed is a broad theme related to frustrated moral expectations. Um, so, and generally within this, subrooted in this theme, there's four sub themes. So creating unrealistic expectations, coming out of um, training or group training, first responders are generally prepared to respond to those like challenging, exciting, dynamic incidents. However, we find that first responders experience occupational events that are either continually unresolved and unresolvable, or that are mundane, common, ridiculous, and even impossible, which can lead to frustration and feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. The second, trying to do good, um, really similarly to not being able to help, which is the primary reason that most first responders go into their, their careers is the desire to help the community. So when you're continually revisiting maybe the same people, the same types of incidents and not being able to have an effect, then this can have some negative effect on, on your being as well. So finally, to minimize and manage frustration, Often PSP will shove their feelings down um, and use avoidance strategies for fear of reprisals from being honest or vulnerable about mental health and perhaps being seen as weak or different compared to other people in their work cohort. Another strategy is through moral compromise, where one creates cognitive and emotional space within their person and their original moral imperative. So if any of you know first responders and knew them prior to becoming a first responder, you may notice that they have some sort of a, a change, which is um, commonly talked about within the community. Um, and this is where their thoughts may turn more to where the world is terrible or anything they do is in vain, which can materialize in annoyance, skepticism, dismissiveness, numbness, anger, bitterness, aggressiveness, and being judgmental. So maybe the salty old uh, police women might be like that, or us younger ones for two. Uh, finally, fighting resolution to the moral suffering or frustration can result in escape behaviors, which can range from changing work areas to leaving the profession or dying by suicide. Next slide, please. All right. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you for sharing those. So now that we have a sense of some of the PMEs that um, first responders and PSP experience, I think it's important to talk about how moral injury can occur. And this is our understanding, and this is a growing understanding. So we just wanna share that this is how we've come to understand this idea. So the first thing is that we have this person and we have this PSP 
And it's important to note that all PSP come with their own unique sets of traits, personalities, histories, and so on. And so not everyone who's exposed to PNEs will necessarily experience a moral injury. However, when you take a certain person and you chronically expose them to PNEs, the likelihood is that they will begin to experience a moral injury. Once they begin to experience that moral injury, which for us is really that breaking, that experience of, again, going back to those three categories, that sense of transgression against self, against others, or betrayal, most people then begin to experience moral injury symptoms. And these symptoms can be a variety of symptoms as illustrated by Leanna, whether that's emotional in terms of hopelessness, jadedness, cynicism, psychological in terms of intrusive thoughts, uh, ruminations, and so on. Um, people can then begin to cycle between these two categories. And so it's really, again, important to note that what we're finding in PSP is this chronic cumulative component. And so many people will then go through these categories of going through a PME, experiencing that moral injury, then beginning to experience moral injury symptoms, and then loop back around against themselves. And so this can obviously then cause some significant difficulties. When we look at the outcomes that people can experience from moral injury, there's really two broad categories, which we've termed to be negative and also positive. On the negative, it's quite possible that people begin to experience both P uh, PTSIs or post-traumatic stress injuries, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, or generalized anxiety disorder. And that moral injury fits often within those categories and overlaps with a lot of these mental health diagnoses. On the more positive side, I think it's also important to note that persons can also experience positive outcomes such as moral growth or moral resiliency. And so it's not necessarily a detrimental component when you experience a moral injury, it's really about your ability to manage, to integrate, and to heal from that moral injury that will very much direct whether you go one way or the other. All right, back to you, Liana. Oh, actually, sorry, it's I have another slide, pardon me. All right, if you can move to the next slide. We also just wanna make a small note about the difference between moral injury and something like PTSD. Although there's often many times where they overlap each other, it's important to note that, again, there it really depends on the nature of the exposure that makes the difference. So with PTSD, it's exposure to substantial threat of physical harm to oneself or one others, well, in moral injury, it's an exposure to transgressions of morals, ethics, or values. And again, this difference between a PME and a PPTE. We also want to note that currently, moral injury is not a clinical diagnosis where something like PTSD is. And we can answer more questions about this idea of moral injury as a clinical diagnosis as we go along. Okay, now back to you, Liam. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, so the frequent PME exposures uh, that PSP experience, along with the behavior and emotional changes, can also prompt changes in their values during the career. So experiences that are common to uh, public safety personnel are uncommon to members of the general public, with death, violence, antisocial behaviors, et cetera. So changes in morals, ethics, and values for public safety personnel may be normal and adapted. However, PSP who are not properly prepared with the skills and capacities to manage the PME exposures may develop decreased abilities to adapt in a positive way, as Lorraine said, work in both different directions. So as coined by Amy Edmondson, a psychologically safe workplace exists when the people involved hold a shared belief that the workplace or team is supported in interpersonal risk taking and employees can voice their opinions or concerns without fear of embarrassment, rejection, or punishment. So when we're taking into consideration management of moral injury in the workplace, um, it's important to note that the cumulative impacts of PME exposures can be mitigated in several ways, including but not limited to supporting empathetic leaders who are identified as such during the promotional process. So looking before people become um, leaders or managers and identifying people who might have these skills 
identifying positive role models and mental health champions within the organization, encouraging supportive teams that can receive demonstrable appreciation from all levels of the organization, encouraging camaraderie by allowing for team building activities, promoting feelings of effectiveness and pride when overcoming adversities, and perhaps allowing for decompression time between expressors. But we also realize reality um, and the difficulty that that may have, but it's important to consider um, that this may be something that can be integrated. Next slide, please. Now for leaders, um, it's important for leadership to establish organizational frameworks for managing PME, PME's exposures and moral injury in the workplace. The ethical culture of any organization is ultimately a key responsibility that falls on leaders, specifically to foster ethically consistent, psychologically safe, and values-based workplaces. Leaders can support ethical cultures by implementing proactive approaches that reduce risk, maximize resilience, and provide early and accessible care for moral injury. Longer term strategies may involve additional training with periodic training associated with organizational personal ethics awareness, expanded occupational resources, like ensuring sufficient staffing levels and equipment to meet the workload and expectations, and exploring management processes, like rotating of staff between high and low stress roles, decompression time, transition time, and maybe enabling flex flexible schedules when possible. All right, next to you. Great. So when we think about the consideration for teams to manage and mitigate PMEs, we're talking about a few different things. So military-based research supports the, the ideas that individuals who are part of cohesive units with high morale may have fewer mental health challenges. So can te cohesive teams with high morale may be, may be psychologically safe environments that are better able to mitigate the impact of PMEs on their members. So support of open communication, cohesion, and morale while also to having dedicated tra and transparent discussions about PMEs may also be incredibly important. This may be particularly relevant when we look at the challenges that PSP have had to go through, whether that's the addiction crisis or COVID-19. So being able to acknowledge the challenges that PSP are experiencing and being able to have that open communication. Leaders can also promote team cohesion and positive mental health support through obtaining their own training, modeling and facilitating positive coping skills, and by encouraging employees to seek out peer and professional support, which is something we'll talk more about in the question period. Next slide, please. So finally, what can individuals do? And this is an important component because we recognize that there needs to be both organizational team and leadership changes, but also individuals can also do a variety of activities to support themselves to address and mitigate PMEs. So some of the examples that we've come up with include things like work to understand your own morals, ethics, and values so that you can better understand yourself and your role as a PSP. This way you can also monitor your own experiences and begin to see if are you, as Leanna said, having the shift of your morals, ethics, and values as you go along during your career as a PSP. Reflect on aspects of your service that provide your life with meaning. So why did you get into the organization? What is a meaningful activity for you in this organization? And engage in meaningful activities that you find rejuvenating, such as making regular use of activities that reduce your stress, such as relaxation, mindfulness, and exercise, making regular use of self-care activities, Engaging in self-reflective and spiritual practices that fit with you and your values to help acknowledge and process the impact that PMEs may have on you. And most importantly, to seek professional support early if you're feeling bothered or distressed by your experiences. Next slide, please. Back to you, Liana. Thank you. And so finally, we we talk about formal and informal supports. And it's important to recognize that those um, who are close to public safety personnel, whether it's friends, family, um, coworkers, even might have insight into changes in behaviors that might indicate an occupational stress injury or moral injury 
And certainly families can be an important source of support and meaning following a peony exposure. Uh, learning, so what a formal and informal supporters can do is learn about peonies and moral injury and what they can use to identify uh, if they're uh, their uh, friend, family member is experiencing some uh, effects from peonies. Should be curious and open to exploring why, whether PSP presenting with distress and impairment may be reacting to a peony, experience at MI or some other uh, psychologically traumatic event. Mental health professionals can develop assistance assessment skills and learn evidence-informed interventions and then progress to evidence-based interventions because the exposures are different in moral injury and PTSD, for example, and the approach uh, health care professionals may take in treating someone with a moral injury may differ as well. Engaging in spiritual, religious, or faith leaders is appropriate to provide holistic care and encouraging public safety personnel to engage in meaningful and pleasurable activities or hobbies outside of their work, like Lorraine mentioned previously. So this is the conclusion of our introduction to our moral injury guide. Um, so now if there are any questions that we have, we're happy to um, discuss those and open our discussion panel. Thank you so much for this enlightening presentation. And again, a gentle reminder that we invite all of you to pose your questions within our Q&A box. And we are going to pose now our first question uh, from the audience, and it's a great one. And the question is as follows. Can Dr. Malloy speak to the nuance of using the words concepts versus laws and principles as the slide presents universal laws, but he spoke universal concepts when presenting it and added principles afterwards in explaining further. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, I apologize for the confusion. So um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Aristotle. Um, so morals would describe universal um, uh, well, laws or principles. Um, he he would he would describe universal principles, I, I think, um, because these are he and Aquinas would argue that these are innate principles that we hold within ourselves. So we may not um, uh, explicitly understand why we would be reacting to certain um, uh, negative. Uh, negative events the way we do, but these are innate as human beings. These are innate uh, reactions to a wrong. So um, I, th I think if we if we said laws, I think that would be more appropriate to, to be speaking about uh, uh, ethics because it's more context and societally driven. Um, I think it's more appropriate to talk about morals as moral principles because they are, uh, as I mentioned, they are more implicit um, um, notions than would an explicit law. I don't know if that answers answers the question. Thank you so very much. We're going to move now to our second question from the audience, another great one. I don't see a focus on the importance of peer-to-peer -peer support. Is that included in the moral injury guide? Oops, sorry, I was muted. I can take that one. And mm -hmm. definitely we do speak to that. And I think that was an oversight in our presentation in terms of that uh, formal and informal support that Leanna was speaking about. We definitely recognize that uh, peer support is a huge component because of the importance that your peers may have either just gone through that experience with you or may have similar experiences and therefore may be able to really resonate with you in a way that other um, sort of formal, whether that's healthcare providers or also just your family members might not be able to do that. 
I think the only caveat that we have in terms of peer support is making sure that it is a safe place to be able to do that work in terms of exploring the PME and maybe even your moral injury. Obviously, when we're talking about a transgression of someone's morals, ethics, or values, it's very sensitive. It's very personal, as Dave said. It, it, it really can challenge who we are, the things that we hold to be important. And so it is important that that is truly a safe space to be able to have that conversation. But definitely peer support is a big component and something that we're definitely looking into. My lovely colleagues, would you like to add anything to that? I think I just like to add briefly too, like Lorraine, you were saying, it's a very personal type of experience or injury. And that's maybe something for peer supporters to be aware of is often uh, people who have a moral injury who have feelings of severe guilt and shame, which also makes it more difficult to come forward and, and speak about it because it really um, speaks to their person. So that's important, I think, to keep in mind as well for peer supporters. Thank you. Let's move on to our next great question from the audience. I'm wondering what assessment tools you use to measure moral injury. For example, do you incorporate the SDAT, Spiritual Distress Assessment Tool, often used by spiritual care staff and chaplains? I'm also wondering how you have engaged research, research around spiritual care and chaplaincy. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna maybe look to uh, our team here again. I can maybe take a first stab and then maybe Suzette, would you like to follow up with that? And then Margaret and, and Nick, if you wanted mm, to sure. as well. Sure. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think what we know is that um, moral injury can often present with a type of spiritual distress. Um, it can really challenge, you know, obviously a person's world orienting view their moral framework, their values framework. It can really challenge their sense of meaning and purpose, their relationality, whether that's with themselves, with others, mm -hmm. if they believe in it, a higher power. Um, and that there's good research to show that spiritual distress can also help to drive the negative symptomology that people experience with moral injury. So if someone's uh, spiritual distress is not being resolved, um, it is quite likely that that is going to impact their moral injury until that spiritual distress is resolved. And so definitely working with spiritual care professionals, chaplains uh, can be very helpful uh, with that. Um, we look at something like the Canadian Armed Forces. We did a study looking at uh, the role of mental health chaplains and that bridging that they can often do as well between taking that person from that initial distress and helping to support them to address not only the spiritual distress, but also then bridge them into formal uh, mental health care can be a really powerful component. So I'm gonna leave it there. And then Suzette, would you like to take over and then Margaret? No, I think that there's um, further to what you said, Lorraine, just taking a holistic approach and allowing people to understand what the, what the moral injury is and exploring what its root is it's important to distill out the different kinds or manifestations of the moral injury and and assess that and then be able to bridge into whether that overlaps with some of the mental health considerations that need to be made so i think that space of figuring out what the assessing um, utilizing some different tools i i put in the chat um a recent um, publication that was that just came out on measuring spiritual distress and moral injury a systematic review and content analysis of existing scales so that people could take a look there, which has been um, published by a number of our colleagues across Canada and beyond. Um, so distilling that out and being able to understand the source of it and look at where there's an overlap um, to normalize the experience where um, someone is experiencing an abnormal or a, a normal response to an abnormal situation and helping them through a variety of different means to be able to um, through peer support, through formal supports, through whatever supports might be appropriate for them formally and informally to resolve it. Margaret, do you want to take it from there? 
Sure. And I'll only comment very briefly. Um, we did look at the mental health and well-being of public safety personnel across the country over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we actually looked at factors that either increased or decreased the likelihood of experiencing a moral injury. And there were two factors in a recent um, study that we're just about to submit for publication. And one was, in fact, having spirituality or having a sense of peace or faith um, in one's life was actually associated with a reduction in moral injury. And that was very interesting to us. And it really suggests that you know there are a number of different approaches to, um, to caring for someone with a moral injury. But it may be, as, as Suzanne and Lorraine are saying, that for individuals who feel this is appropriate and where this is part of their lives, you know, chaplaincy or a spiritual approach may in fact be quite important for a number of individuals, including the PSP community. So not advocating for one approach or another, but simply noting that that was a factor that was associated with a decrease in moral injury. The other factor that was heavily associated with um, a reduction in moral injury among public safety personnel across the country was the presence of strong organizational support. And I think all of the speakers today have addressed that and having a sense that your organization cares for you and has your back um, really does make a very big difference in terms of reducing moral injury among public safety personnel <laughs> and also healthcare workers as well. We've had similar findings in healthcare workers. Thank you very much. Another great question again from our audience. And again, it's around therapy and intervention related. What are the most effective therapeutic interventions currently being used or showing the most promise? for the treatment of moral injury? I mean, if I may, um, I, I saw a question um, below asking about what would be, what action could an organization do to operationalize safety? And I just want to comment that really understanding the comment of more or the concept of moral injury tends to be very helpful for people. So, you know, during the pandemic, I often um, would go on to COVID-19 units or give talks to different professional organizations, um, including public safety personnel. And oftentimes hearing the concept moral injury actually gave people words for their experience. They said, you know, I was really struggling with this but I didn't have the words to describe it. Um, I often felt that I was alone and feeling shame or guilt, or a deep sense of anger and betrayal. But when I'm sitting here listening to this talk about moral injury, it's helping me to, to not feel alone. I think also having events like this, which increase our understanding around moral injury, gives us words to speak to one another, right? And I think it goes beyond those simple words of moral injury to feelings of guilt and shame but also we really saw this during the pandemic, especially with a sense of betrayal, right? So people felt either hurt, um, they might have felt ashamed, they might have felt that their organization didn't have their back or the government, for whatever reason, didn't have enough PPE available, there wasn't enough training available. We heard from public safety personnel who said, you know, in the time that it took me to put on my PPE, because I had to, someone may have lost their life while we were getting ready to go in to a call. And, you know, these are difficult, they're really difficult things to face. It includes, you know, having to restrict visitors, um, having to enforce regulations that one may or may not agree with, tension around vaccine ma masking within different um, stations and halls. But I think ultimately having knowledge of the concept of moral injury is really, really powerful in helping people not to feel alone and having words to talk about this. So I just wanted to address that. Is one, I think that's one very effective thing that or, effective thing that organizations can do is really to increase understanding and awareness around this concept. It helps a lot. I really believe that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Mackin. And, and eventually they also address as part of therapy sessions as well, that self-awareness and education. Thank you. We have another great question, actually. Are moral injuries going to become its own diagnosis or will it be included in another mental health diagnosis? May I comment? I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep jumping in. I apologize. This is the last time I'll, I'll comment. I'm just going to say this. I think what's really important about moral injury is that it can occur across mental health conditions, right? So you can experience a moral injury if you're facing depression, anxiety, a post-traumatic stress injury. It's not something that occurs only with PTSIs. And I think that really speaks to how we need to assess people 
regardless of what the mental health difficulty is for moral injury, I think that's incredibly important. And if we, in the DSM-5, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for the clinicians and the audience, I would really consider that a specifier. So much like with PTSD, we say the dissociative or non-dissociative subtype of PTSD. I think it would be incredibly helpful when we look at mental health conditions to say with or without moral injury, particularly among service personnel, like public safety personnel. Thank you. And Another great one. Yeah, regarding Go the ahead. question about yeah, moral injury becoming a diagnosis, this is something we've discussed in our group quite a bit. Um, but I'd like to put that over to one of the clinicians, and something that Nick is pretty passionate about, I think. Dr. Carlton. Sure. I, I agree with uh, what Dr. McKinnon uh, said. I, I We don't have a moral injury disorder right now. I, I dropped into the typed chat a long answer. The short answer is we don't have a moral injury disorder. We might in the future, but we don't need one in order to provide someone with no, a diagnosis exactly. that can lead to treatment. Yeah. Just like a PTSI can lead to post-traumatic stress. This is exactly what Dr. McKenna was saying, can lead to a diagnosis of PTSD or major depressive disorder. We can also have a moral injury that could be consistent with a diagnosis of PTSD or major depressive disorder. So you put the specifier on there so the clinicians know better how to try and engage with the symptoms. We might have one in the future, but uh, that's that's a to be decided thing. If Absolutely. I can, if I can add to that too, um, Nick and Margaret, I think with a specifier, it allows us in, in thinking about it as you've named it, Margaret, across the multiple different kinds of yeah, diagnosis, exactly. but then it opens the door to a variety of different kinds of interventions too, within diagnosed conditions and also outside of it. So going back to another question, uh, previous question, looking at where the diagnosis is and then what kinds of treatment approaches there are that some uh, for some individuals do, use, utilizing a cognitive behavioral approach or an exposure-based approach might work, a brief exposure-based approach, ADT, um, ACT may be appropriate. For some, utilizing yeah. ACT for MI or what we're calling AMPS might be appropriate. For others, it might be that um, we try some novel and emerging um, interventions, um, for example, accelerated resolution therapy or these emerging ones that are yet to be fully fully endorsed and evidence behind them fully, but um, 3MDR, virtual reality supported psychotherapy, we're finding some good effects with that with moral injury. Um, so it, but when we broaden out the, the added as a specifier, then it opens up the space for yeah. a person-centered approach to, um, to what might be appropriate for a particular individual. And for some, it might not be um, a formal mental health approach. It might be that, um, that utilizing social supports within the community or peer supports um, to help them better connect where they're feeling quite isolated. Um, so in, in that way, there's a continuum of how moral injury might impact someone and looking at it that way to see what kind of degree or extent of therapy um, might, be, might be warranted or needed. And also some of the complexities that can come with that across other comorbidities and multiple diagnoses diagnostic criteria that it might fit within or you have your hand up. Yeah, only in one sentence, just to say I completely agree with you so that about the exploration of multiple approaches. Um, it's very clear, though, that we need to remember um, that, you know, there's exposure to a morally injurious event. So that could be exposure to some to an event that challenged your moral or ethical beliefs. It does not necessarily mean people go on to incur the injury, right? So the injury is what follows for some people and not all people, right? So some may experience moral distress, which is quite healthy and normal. And mom, some may go on to experience a moral injury associated with the guilt shame, betrayal, onset of mental health conditions, and so on. So I think it's always really important for us to, just as you were saying, so that just as you said, to really frame it within that context. I think, too, to, to also look at where sometimes it's the moral injury underneath um, some of these other yeah. conditions that might be holding back someone from being able to become, be able to progress through the course of the recovery. So the importance of being able to recognize it, name it, assess it, Look at the appropriate type of intervention that would would be um, agreeable to the individual to be able to help them overcome some of that shame, guilt, sense of betrayal, um, and help them reconnect with themselves, with others, and with that which is beyond themselves for those who have that that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think 
I'd go back to what Margaret was talking to is that like, part of the big reason why we're here and we have the guide isn't is to kind of try and prevent moral injury or mitigate the what the effects of exposure to PMIEs um, to mitigate the exposure and what the effect they might have on first responders. I think that's the key thing with the guide. I'm that's where I come from. I'm not a clinician. I'm an injury prevention specialist. So I think that's an important thing to keep in context with our part of our discussions today as well. But um, that not everyone's going to get a moral injury. You may have symptoms of a moral injury, just like you might for other occupational stress disorders. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a moral injury that's going to interfere with your abilities to do things um, um, from day to day. So I think that brings yeah. up something, Lorena or um, Liana, across a continuum of different kinds of interventions from looking at how we can prepare people as they're going into service. So scenario-based training, for example, that includes morals, ethics, and values and exposing people to different um, situations or having them pre-think pre -think through that. There's also other interventions across the continuum, depending on how severe those symptoms might be and what might be warranted. So it opens up a, a raft of different kinds of interventions. I don't know if I want to speak with that. I also know Dave had a sample. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Suzette. I, I think that's really important that, of course, we're talking about, um, you know, methodologies and, and, and therapies once someone has a moral injury. But uh, I think we really need to think seriously about what we can do as a preventative measure. And I think that involves um, individuals really doing uh, value audits of themselves. And I think organizational organizations doing value audits to find out what what they really authentically believe and how they really intend to act, um, rather than uh, you know just assuming that people are are uh, equipped with their self knowledge of what their values are. I th I think many of us don't take the time uh, or don't know how to ask ourselves those kinds of questions. So preparedness for for moral injury or moral stress is uh, uh, I think also equally important. Um, if I may just comment on um, two pieces of research that we did in our lab. One was that we asked public safety personnel um, who were receiving inpatient treatment at Homewood, you know, what are the unique aspects of mental health difficulties um, among public safety personnel? And there was many, many people, just to say, said moral injury. They really felt this is a part of what public safety personnel experience. Um, Sophia Roth, who was a student in my lab, also looked at, you know, it's not just what we're experiencing in the present moment, it's also what we've experienced in the past, right, and how that guides our responses to things happening right now. And so when Sophia looked at this in public safety personnel, she found, or they found rather, that when people um, who have a history of childhood abuse or trauma may be more vulnerable to moral injury is public safety personnel and also as military members. So, you know, when you've been taught as a child, for example, that you're guilt, that you're dirty, you're shameful, you're not worthy, you can re reenact those same feelings when you're experiencing that during adult life. So it's really important to think about the past in relation to this. But what Sophia also found was that when we were able to identify our emotions, so to say, you know, I am, I think I am experiencing some guilt right now, some shame, I am feeling betrayed. That ability to recognize emotions was actually helped to protect people with, despite having a history of childhood abuse. So I think really working on awareness and understanding is a really important way, again, of addressing moral injury. I think with that too, being able to know how to process that and to be able mm -hmm. to shift one's perspective really. so that flexibility of thinking and and appreciating uh, other ways of being um, and the emotional regulation that comes with that. Absolutely. And then learning how yeah. to work through those things, important pieces. Because it cuts down, there's something about moral injury that cuts down to one's very core in identity. And if the, that sense of identity and attachment and connection is is fragile, um, then it makes it more, um, then those things need to be repaired and, and strengthened so that someone can then move on and be able to accept and embrace 
who they are and also separate it from what they may have done or what they may have seen or what to separate the doing from the being and um and be able to embrace the goodness of who they are yep like if we i, I agree so that and if we think about anger as a secondary emotion there's often something else Absolutely. driving it right so is that a sense of hurt for example so i feel hurt that my organization didn't support me that hurt reminds me of something in the past for example yeah. that hurt me and so i'm re-experiencing that now um i think there's a lot of work that could be done as you say so there's so much in this area that's so important to explore yeah oh. a lot of it a lot of it needs to be explored and then a lot of it needs to be recognized in the awareness and then applying a variety of tools and i think you know there's so many tools people can do on the on their own and then the organizational component and the relational component you know everything from self-acceptance and um, journaling that people can do to connecting and hearing themselves doing value audits on the individual level but those imperative pieces of community connection organizational leadership katie has a thought so speaking in regards to that because this is very important and this has really gathered a lot of interest among our audience the question is really what are the most effective therapeutic interventions currently being used or showing the most promise for the treatment of moral injury and we have less than four minutes left I mean, I think there are a number of things out there that Sue that sort of went through um, and discussed, but I want to really encourage us to think about those those therapies, but also to think about what comes next as well, right? And I think there's often a belief that we have to focus on thoughts to help with to reco recovery and emotions, but we have to also remember that part of moral injury is also our bodies, right? So with Luz, Ruth Lanius, we scanned the brains of public safety personnel as they remembered a morally injurious event. And they would say that feels like having a kick in the stomach, right? When you recollect something that was, you know, really that gave you a sense of guilt or shame, you felt that sense in your gut that this was wrong, right? And what we found in those studies was that areas of the brain associated with disgust, associated with vomiting or nausea, um, areas of the brain associated with monitoring shame, those areas of the brain lit up during recollection of these events. So I think when we think about targeting moral injury, let's remember to think not only about, um, you know, trying to change thoughts, but also how do we help our body to be in an optimal zone of arousal, to not be re-experiencing that sense of the gut and being punched in the gut when remembering this, right? And that can be things like, you know, using sensory optics to help ground yourself. Grounding is a very important tool post-traumatic stress injuries it could be mindfulness that's been adjusted for trauma because trauma remembering that trauma can also um when we have to be present in our bodies it can be difficult with a history of trauma but there are ways of doing that to modify for trauma mindfulness um you know, so that uses 3mdr which involves movement so just remembering especially for people who you know have a preference not necessarily for talking about this but for doing we can use our bodies as well to help us to get through these injuries as well. Yoga is another way that's been shown to be quite effective in PTSD in some, some populations. Thank you so very much. Well, many thanks to our great panelists for delivering such an important presentation and discussion. And of course, to all of you who have joined us in the audience today. Your engagement with this topic has created, as we have seen, such a meaningful dialogue this morning and speaks once again to what a crucial conversation this is. Um, also, great news to share, um, SIPSERD invites you to save the date for its upcoming conference, Thriving in Public Safety, Research to Action. It will be held in Regina, Saskatchewan from May 6th to May 8th, 2025. So again, placing that on our calendar, May 6th to May 8th, 2025. And um, please watch uh, the Sipstered website and social media channels for details to be released as they become available. Thank you so much again. Thank you.